Hey, so we're going to take a little bit of time here to uh, look at the text today and some of the things that I'm talking about, people will use an argument saying that, well, that's just your interpretation and your interpretation is wrong. All right. Well, what I say into response to that argument is that a lot of these texts that I talk about don't really require any interpretation. You don't have to be some cognitive genius to be able to interpret these things. That being said, I've studied the text since before I was a teenager and continue to and uh, probably have a pretty good idea of uh, a, a correct interpretation. But let's go through some of these texts that kind of catch people up and take a look at what they say. You know, I think one of the greatest evidences that the things that I'm talking about in the text are correct is that they just don't require interpretation. They just require taking them at face value. But a religious system has come along and that religious system has given a bunch of interpretations of these texts, or actually most of these texts they've just wholly ignored. And they have this habit of turning everything into a metaphor. And when you turn something into a metaphor, well, you can then turn it into anything you want it to be. Oh, it doesn't mean that. Let me explain what it means. That's gnosis. That's Gnosticism, secret information. Well, I know it says that, but it doesn't mean that. Let me tell you what it really means. No, you don't need to do that. You just need to be honest and take what the text is saying at face value, right? Let's do some of that right now. We're going to take a bit of time here. Um, I'm going to go through some of the texts that I have in my study called Who is Yahweh? Now, the Christian church is divided on who Yahweh is. Some say Yahweh is the father of Yeshua. Some say, like the Mormon church, no, Yahweh is Yeshua. And you've got a, a rough divide in the church, probably around 70-30. Around 70% 70 of the Christian church thinks Yahweh is the Father. And around 30% thinks that Yahweh is the Son of the Father, Yeshua. Why does such a divide exist? Because the text doesn't say one way or the other who Yahweh is. It doesn't say he's the Father. It doesn't say he's the Son. Right? Yahweh never spoke about having a son. Right? The text where it says, you know, today you have become my son is the adoption of David and making him king. It's not any connection to Yeshua. It's not a real son. He's talking to an adult man and saying, you know, I'm adopting you. Today you have become my son. So nowhere in the text does Yeshua say he has a son. What's Really interesting is that he also never says that he has a father. <laughs> so here is this father and son relationship that we all know about, and it's, it's so strong. Can you see that, Bok? I've kind of got my phone propped up here. That's not blocking the view. Um, you've got this dynamic between Yeshua and his father, and they're like this, right? They are so tight. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. I only do what I see the father doing. Right, um, And yet, with this incredible relationship, you never see Yahweh talking about either his father or his son. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Why wouldn't he be? I mean, they're like this. But he doesn't mention, if he was the son, surely he would be talking about his father. If he was the father, surely he'd be talking about his son. Now, some might say, well, Yeshua wasn't born until much later. 
Yeshua was the creator of everything. He's the, the engineer. He's the creator. We know this from John chapter 1 and other portions of the text as well. So, that's a dilemma. If Yahweh was the father, he'd be talking about the son. If Yahweh was the son, he'd be talking about his father. But there's not a single instance of that in the entirety of the text. Hmm. See, deductive reasoning is really important. You need to be able to consider information like that and go, wait a minute, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Yes, surely the father would be talking about his son and surely the son would be talking about his father. Yeshua could not shut up talking about his father when he was here. Right? So who is Yahweh? Maybe Yahweh isn't the father and nor the son. Maybe he's not either one of them. So let's look at some text together. I've got my iPad here, and we're just going to scroll around. I'll read some stuff out to you. And we'll start to see that if we don't get into this idea of, oh, this is the Christian interpretation, turning into metaphor and then providing an explanation, Gnosticism, which is ironic because people accuse me of being a Gnostic. No, my friend. You see, one of the greatest evidences that the things I'm talking about are correct is that I'm an extreme literalist when it comes to the text. Now, that doesn't mean a fundamentalist. I'm not a Christian. That doesn't mean I'm a Christian fundamentalist. People confuse literalism with fundamentalism. No, they are two very different things. What I mean by being an extreme literalist is I try to take the biblical text at face value. I don't try to turn it into a metaphor so I can then turn it into any darn thing I please. I just want to read the text for what it says. If you wouldn't mind, give me some engagement so we can invite a few more people in here. Some thumbs up, some hearts, whatever you want to do. And we're going to spend half an hour together here probably uh, going over some of this text and looking at some of these things that you will never hear about, no matter how long you go to a church. You could be born in the church and die in the church. Go to, go to a fellowship your entire life, every Sunday without missing a beat. And you'll never hear some of these biblical texts that I'm going to read out to you right now. All right? Now, let's look at this instance where Satan um, is talked about in First Chronicles chapter 21. And this is the start of the book. I'll read it out to you. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, Go, number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring me a report that I may know their number. But Joab said, May the Lord, wait, the Lord, that's interesting. Didn't we just read Satan? Then Satan stood against Israel. Now Joab is replying, may the Lord, huh, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as there are. <clears throat> are they not, my Lord, my King, all of them, my Lord's servants? Why then should my Lord require this? Now you think, what's wrong with just counting some people? Because it wasn't just counting people, it was branding them. Right? It was putting a brand on them, just like we're going to see with the mark of the beast. It is a physical brand. The text says it will be a mark received in the skin. Right? It's not a vaccine, but certainly the vaccine and everything that's going on right now appears, at least, to be moving to create that beast system that people talk about, where they eventually will roll out a mark. The COVID thing is winding down, but there'll be more to come. So let me continue. Why then should my Lord require this? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? But my king's word prevailed against Joab. 
So Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came back to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering, numbering of the people to David. That is 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Now, let me just read the first sentence again. Um, then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, go number Israel. All right. That story is in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Now, what's interesting about this story is it appears twice in the biblical text. Twice. And it's almost verbatim both times, except for one stunning difference. In 1 Chronicles 21, it says, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. Then Satan incited David to number Israel. Right? But in 2 Samuel 24, the same story is there. <clears throat> Almost word for word. And no scholarship disagrees that this is the exact same event. But the word choice in the first sentence is markedly different. So I know I'm going to be a little repetitive because repetition is the mother of all learning, right? So again, in First Chronicles 21, it says, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. Right? But this is what it says in 2 Samuel 24, the exact same story. Again, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel and he incited David against them. Excuse me? Uh, there must be some mistake. In 1 Chronicles 21, it says, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. In 2 Samuel 24, it says, Again, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them. The same story, one in 2 Samuel, one in 1 Chronicles. One says the person inciting David to number Israel is Satan. The other one says it's Yahweh. Wow, Samantha says. Yes, wow. What? Now, what's even more interesting about this is in scholarship, in biblical scholarship, we have what we call the, the principle of first mention. The principle of first mention. That means that when a word or a term is used the very first time in the text, it carries a weight with it. It's important. It's the principle of first mention. Guess when the very first time the biblical text ever uses this Hebrew word for the adversary, which is hasatan, where we get Satan from. Oh, you got it. It's this text. And in this text... For the very first time, using the word that we translate as Satan or the adversary, the very first time, it's talking about Yahweh. Now, you know, I see the numbers dropping. People turn off, oh, I can't handle this. This is nonsense. This is heresy. Except this doesn't stand alone. We're going to go through a number of examples right now where I'll show you the Bible is crystal clear that Yahweh is Satan, our adversary. You guys, oh, I can't accept that. The truth doesn't change based on your acceptance of it or not. You understand that? Yeshua didn't come to bring us a new religious system. He came to bring us himself. He came to set us free from all the religious systems. And then Rome, over a period of several centuries, 
created a religious system that today we call Christianity. Its real name is Roman Universalism. Universal is Catholic. Catholic means universal. It is supposed to be the one world religion. So, let's take a look at another example. And you think you went, wow, at that one. Oh, I have better examples. So, <clears throat> let's take a look at Revelation chapter 13. Now, Revelation chapter 13 is one of the most famous chapters in the whole Bible. It's the chapter that talks about the mark of the beast that we were just talking about. It talks about this control system where humans, those of us that follow Yeshua, are going to have to either submit to this world system or die. Well, let's read what it says about the beast itself, right? We all know about the beast in Revelation. There are two beasts in Revelation. It looks like a father and son kind of deal, right? Let's read from Revelation chapter 13. And let's look specifically at the description. Now remember, this is the Lord's, Yeshua's, revelation to John. This is really important. Okay? This is Yeshua's revelation to John. And here is how Yeshua describes the beast. He says, And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Hmm. So we have a beast like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. A beast like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. And this beast demands the whole world worships it. So, is there any other instance in the entirety of the biblical text where a beast, like a leopard, a lion, and a bear, is mentioned? Perhaps someone that demands that everybody worship him? Wouldn't that be interesting? So, let's just, before we go on, let's just recap that. Yeshua is telling us that the beast in Revelation that is going to roll out the world control system, the mark of the beast, and control everybody, demand everyone worship him, is a beast like a leopard and a lion and a bear. This is, you know, someone went, wow, before. Well, hold your horses. In Hosea chapter 13, Yahweh describes himself to Israel. And this is what he says. But I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. You know no God besides me. He demanding worship. And besides me, there is no Savior huh, taking the position of Messiah. So, he continues, I am to them, to Israel, like a lion, like a leopard. I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their breasts and I will devour them like a lion, as a wild beast would rip them open. I mean, what do you say? The identical way that Yeshua reveals to us in his revelation to John of the beast at the end who demands all worship, who is described as a beast like a leopard and a lion and a bear, is identical to the way Yahweh had described himself centuries earlier, millennia earlier, to the Israelites. 
This is not someone else's description of Yahweh. This is Yahweh himself talking, describing himself, saying, I am your God, demanding worship. I am like a leopard and a lion and a bear. You know, why do we go to church for 50 years of our lives and never ever hear about any of this stuff? Why is it hidden from us? And then when I start to point out these things, just literally at face value, we're not interpreting any of this. We're just reading what the text actually says. That's it. No wrong interpretation because there is no interpretation. It's just taking it literally at face value. I'm not saying, well, let me explain what it all means. No, I don't have to. It's plain. It's plain. But there's more. You want to see some more? Let's take a look at some more. <clears throat> so, let's take a look at some things that the Apostle Paul said in his second letter to the Corinthians. So, <clears throat> first of all, he says, this is in chapter 3, he says, However, their minds become closed. In fact, to this day, the same veil is still there because when they read the Tanakh, the Old Testament, uh, it isn't removed because only Yeshua can remove it. Yet even today, when they read the books of Moses, a veil covers their minds. But whenever a person turns to Yeshua, the veil is taken away. Then in chapter 4, he goes on. He says, So, if the good news that we tell others is covered with a veil, it is hidden from those who are dying. The God of this world, the God of this age. Now, this scripture, and we'll, I'll come back to it actually. The God of this age has blinded the minds of those who don't believe in Yeshua. As a result, they don't see the light of the good news about Yeshua's glory. It is Yeshua who is God's image. Now, let's go back to that verse here. Um, this is in verse 3, where it says, The God of this age has blinded their minds. Because of this verse, people take the God of this age or the God of this world as being Satan, right? But if for a brief moment we could just forget that we knew about this passage here written by Luke, Paul, sorry, and if I was to just ask you, based on the entirety of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, based upon Torah, who is the God of this world? Forget the connotation with the God of this world or Satan. No, no, no. Forget that that connotation even exists. Just a simple question. According to the entirety of Torah, who is the God of this world? Yahweh. I mean, there's no, what do you mean? Yeah. Yahweh. He says it himself over and over again. There's, there's no argument, there's no dispute about this. Yahweh is the God of this world. He says it over and over again. Right. What does Paul say about the God of this world? What does Paul say about Yahweh? Give me some more engagement and see if we can get some more people in here. Um, he says, Yahweh has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. So there is a veil, and the veil has to be lifted by Yeshua. And the veil comes by reading the law of Moses, Torah, which talks about the God of this age being Yahweh. Connecting the dots? 
It's not hard. It's amazing, isn't it? You don't need to interpret. Don't need to turn it into a metaphor and then explain it like a Gnostic, like Christians do. Just need to look at the text itself. Okay, let's continue. <clears throat> so, Moses saw Yahweh face to face. I have a separate video called Yahweh the Physical God, where we go over all of the texts that talks about Yahweh being a physical being, just like us. You say, oh, no. Yahweh even told the Israelites to poop outside of the camp so he wouldn't step in their feces. We see people in the Old Testament washing the feet of Yahweh, giving Yahweh water and food. What do you think all the sacrifices in the Old Testament were about? It's a barbecue. It's literally a barbecue. He's cooking meat. Right? You think, oh, come on. Go read it. A soothing aroma in his nostrils. It's a barbecue, dude. You're roasting meat over an open fire. It's food. It's food for Yahweh. Yahweh has his stolen people cooking him food. And he gets upset when they don't. Now we're about to read here in Deuteronomy 34.10 where it also says that. It says, And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom Yahweh knew intimately face to face. And my video again called Yahweh the Physical God goes into numerous texts where it shows clearly Yahweh is a real physical person. Let's look at this story about Moses, though. So Moses murders a couple of Egyptians. And then Yahweh goes, oh, yeah, you're my man. Fellow murderer. Come on, Moses, we can work together. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy 32, from Deuteronomy 34, and from Jude. Jude was the Lord's half-brother, a natural-born son of Mary that was married to Joseph. Okay? And we're going to tie some pieces together here. This won't take long. I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to read the, the parts that are important to us right now. That very day, Yahweh, this is Deuteronomy 32, verses 48 through 52. That very day, Yahweh spoke to Moses. He said, go up this mountain, which is in the land of Moab, and view the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel for a possession, and die on the mountain which you go up. Because you broke faith with me in the midst of the people. He's referring to when he struck the rock. It pissed him off. Could you imagine Yeshua or Yeshua's father being upset when people were dying of dehydration? And for some reason, Moses knew that if he struck a rock, a spring of water would pour forth. Could you imagine Yeshua or Yeshua's father disciplining somebody and saying, you should have just trusted me. The people were dying. They had no water. And Yahweh punishes Moses for not displaying faith in him in front of the people. This is not a good person. This Yahweh, as we're about to see, it gets even worse. 
Um, because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the people of Israel. For you shall see the land before you, but you shall not go there into the land that I am giving to the people of Israel. So he broke his promise. He lied to Moses. Told him previously he was going to enter the promised land. Now he's saying, no, change my mind. Now I'm going to kill you because you embarrassed me in front of the people. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine Yeshua being like that or, yeah, or Yeshua's father being like that? I'm going to embarrass you. Oh, you embarrassed me, so I'm going to kill you now. But that's what he says. Then Moses went up. This is now verse 34. So Yahweh told him prior to this happening. Now it's happening. Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 through 7. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, and Yahweh showed him all the land. And Yahweh said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of Yahweh, died there in the land of Moab, according to the will of Yahweh. He killed him. Yahweh murders Moses. We'll keep going. You think, oh, I don't know about that. We'll keep going here. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, but no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were undimmed. He had perfect vision and his vigor unabated. Perfectly healthy man. People want to say these are the books of Moses. Who wrote this? Moses didn't write this. He was dead. Yahweh wrote Torah. That's why it's so clearly so intricate. It's way beyond some of the patterns in Torah are beyond what a human could have penned. So, Yahweh tells Moses, I'm going to kill you. Then, Yahweh kills Moses. Then, in Jude... Verse 9, Jude is just a one-chapter book written by Yeshua's own half-brother, a son of Joseph and Mary. Okay? And this is so interesting. One verse that contains so much information. Let's read it. When the archangel Michael argued with the devil... They were arguing over the body of Moses. <laughs> but Michael didn't dare to hand down a judgment against the devil. Instead, Michael said, May the master or may the Lord reprimand or rebuke you. Huh. So here is this devil that the archangel Michael is arguing with over the body of Moses. Wait, I mean, hang on. There's so many things to unpack here. He's arguing with the devil over the body of Moses. But there's only one person that knew where the body of Moses was. Right? Let's read what it says in Deuteronomy again. <clears throat> so Moses, the servant of Yahweh, died there in the land of Moab according to the will of Yahweh. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. How is the archangel Michael arguing with the devil over the body of Moses when Yahweh is the only person that knew where the body of Moses was buried? How does that work? Yahweh buries Moses 
writes himself in the text, no one knows where his body is. And here's the half-brother of Yeshua, Jesus. Now, when you're the half-brother of Yeshua, when you've grown up with this guy all your life, <laughs> you've learned a few things, right? And here he is relaying this little snippet of information that the archangel, this warrior, protector angel, came and had a conversation, an argument, with the devil over the body of Moses. Now, where it gets even more interesting is that he wouldn't rebuke the devil. I mean, Christians go around rebuking the devil every five minutes, right? I mean, you know the type, right? I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. But Michael wouldn't. Why would this warrior angel not rebuke or reprimand the devil? Well, if the devil was Yahweh, that would make sense. Right? So it's not just one little text here or there. There are multiple examples in the text that spell out exactly who Yahweh is. Yahweh is the only one who knew where the body of Moses was buried. Now the archangel Michael is arguing with Yahweh over the body of Moses. Why did the father or the son or both want the body of Moses? Because he didn't belong to Yahweh. Yahweh stole him, tricked him, deceived him, and then murdered him. Allison says he couldn't rebuke him because he's above him in rank. Oh, yeah. Yahweh is a son of the king. This warrior angel is not part of the royal family. He doesn't have any right to rebuke royalty. Right? Now, that starts to go off into some of the other things that we talk about. We're not going to dive into that today. We'll just try to stay on, on topic here. So, with all that in mind, let's now go to Yeshua in the Gospels, in the book of John, my favorite book in the entire Bible, to chapter 8. And let's make sure that we, uh, we are setting context. So we're not taking anything out of context. So we get this right. We, we won't need to interpret anything. We'll just need to take the text at face value. When we start interpreting things, that means we're turning them into metaphor. And that enables us to turn it into anything we want. We don't want to do that. We just want to read the text at face value. All right? Biblical literism, literalism is not Christian fundamentalism. So John chapter 8, verse 19, first of all. The Pharisees asked him, where is your father? Because they knew he was like a bastard child. They, they knew the whole story about Mary. I mean, and Jesus replied, you don't know me or my father. Now, these are the Pharisees, right? These are the Pharisees that have a temple, and are completely and utterly committed to Yahweh in every way, shape, and form. They worship Yahweh. They have Yahweh's temple. Right? And Jesus replies and says, You don't know me or my father. Huh. So straight up here, he's telling these Pharisees, who are absolutely committed to following Yahweh. You don't know my father. So, Yahweh is not Yeshua's father. And it's not him neither, because he says, you don't know me or my father. So now we have ruled out with Yeshua's own words that Yahweh, the God of the Jews, is neither Yeshua nor his father. From Yeshua's 
own lips. Let's go to John 8, verse 41 through 45. Yeshua says to them, you're doing what your father does. <clears throat> the Jews said to Jesus, we're not illegitimate children like you. God is our only father. Oh, and now we've clarified everything. Yahweh, God, is our only father. Yahweh is our only father. It's important to know the context because in the next verse we're about to read, Christians jump up and down and yell screaming and say, no, he's not talking about Yahweh. Yes, he is. The Jews themselves, the Pharisees themselves, just clarified it for us. God, Yahweh, is our only Father. Now let's see what Yeshua had to say about the Pharisees' God, their only Father. Yeshua told them, If God, the real God, were your Father, you would love me. I'm, after all, I'm here and I came from God. I didn't come on my own. Instead, God sent me. Why don't you understand the language I use? Is it because you can't understand the words I use? And so you see here, even the discussions we have about what he's saying here today were the same discussions they were having back there. Wait, your father, my father, no, and you're getting all confused. What are you talking about? No. The Jews already clarified it. God is their only father. And Yeshua said a few verses back, you don't know me nor my father. Hmm. And, and here is, is where Yeshua picks up the ball and drop kicks it all the way down the field. You come from your father, the devil. In Jude 9, we see that the devil being talked about can only be Yahweh because Yahweh is the only one that knew where the body of Moses was, and that's what they're arguing over. Now here again, <laughs> he says, your father is the devil. You come from your father, the devil, and you desire to do what your father wants you to do. Now, what do they desire to do to him right now? To murder him, to kill him. Oh, all the connections, can you see them or not? The devil was a murderer from the beginning. He has never been truthful. He doesn't know what the truth is. Whenever he tells a lie, he's doing what comes naturally to him. He's a liar and the father of lies. We've just gone through some incredibly detailed, plain, biblical texts that tell us who Yahweh really is. And Christianity wants to come along and say, oh, no, he's God. Well, yes, he's the God of this world. He's the God of this age. He's the one that's blinded everyone with his law, as Paul says in his second letter to the Corinthians. I'm going to read it again straight through. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. You come from your father, the devil, and you desire to do what your father wants you to do. The devil was a murderer from the beginning, from the Genesis, where he killed Adam and Eve by kicking them out of the garden containing the fruit of the tree of life. <clears throat> he has never been truthful. 
He doesn't know what the truth is. Whenever he tells a lie, he's doing what comes naturally to him. He's a liar and the father of lies. And context is important. The Christian thinks the Bible's the word of God, but wait a minute, John 1, 1 and Revelation tell us Yeshua is the word of God. Revelation specifically says that Yeshua's name is the word of God. In John 1, 1, in the beginning, the word of God existed. Not a Bible, a person, right? When you take the Bible as the word of God, when you take it as this, this entire book that is just the absolute infallible, truthful words from God, you're making a massive error. You're not entertaining the possibility that maybe this father of all lies that Yeshua is talking about is somebody mentioned in the text. Maybe someone quoted in the text. And if they're lying, but you take it as the truth, then you are deceived. A veil has come down over your mind. Just because, hang on, someone, so that won't happen. Um, we need to make sure that when we're listening to people in the text that we know a little bit of context and background on these people. If Yahweh is the devil, if he's the, the Hasatan, Satan, if he's the one that just lies all the time, then we better be very careful about reading his words and taking it as though God the father of Yeshua was speaking it to us, right? Context. So very, very important. Let's look at another last thing before we go. <clears throat> what should we look at here? <laughs> In John 12, let's just take a look at a few little verses here. John 12, it says, the world is being judged now. The ruler of this world will be thrown out now. Who's the ruler of this world? Again, according to the entirety of Torah, which is the scripture of all these people that he's talking to, according to their worldview, their perspective, context is important. The people that he's talking to, who did they see as the ruler of this world? Yahweh. You understand? <clears throat> Here in John 10, verse 8, he says, All who came before me are thieves and robbers. All is pretty encompassing, right? Pretty all-encompassing. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. Did Yahweh come before Yeshua? All who came before me are thieves and robbers. That's why I say that Yahweh stole Yeshua's own people out of Egypt where he had put them for safekeeping. And, you know, I recommend you go and watch my study called Who is Yahweh and Two Gardens and a Snake and start to learn uh, about all these things. There's so much more here we could go through. I just want to know what's real. I want to know what the truth is. I love my Lord. My honor and my dedication to Yeshua, Jesus, if you will, is undying. I gave my life to Yeshua when I was 11 years or 12 years of age, and I have never, ever, not one single day, not one single hour or minute, turned my back on him. Nor will I. I am his. I belong to the kingdom. And it is absolutely imperative to me to know what is real, to know what is true. Truth does not come easily, 
And there are so many religions out there. And even in Christianity, we have so many denominations that all disagree with each other and all say completely different things. They can't even make up their mind on who Yahweh is. Is Yahweh the Father or is Yahweh the Son? Depends where you first got indoctrinated. But the Bible doesn't say he's either. The Bible and Yeshua from his own lips on multiple occasions clarifies that Yahweh is the adversary of humankind. Do you think that the Father or the Son would take these people that were in a little bit of hardship in Egypt and then march them around a desert for 40 years to go to some land where it would have only taken them a few days to get there? He just marched them around in circles. Oh, you know, there's an interesting piece in the scripture about that, actually. Yahweh fed them manna in the desert, right? Right? But Yeshua says that the manna that you received in the desert was not from heaven, and that one day you'd receive the true manna, the bread of life, from heaven. Oh, there's many more instances like this that will just come to mind. But if you watch these videos, we go over all of we, that we've just gone through now and much, 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 much more. Yeshua did not come to deceive us into another religious system. He didn't come to bring us religion. He came to bring us himself. He came to set us free from religion. And we are humans. We are his creation. And the way that we honor him is to start to learn about him. And the best way you can do that is to go through the Gospels with my five questions. And... Uh, I'll post them in the comments below here on this video. So if someone shared this, you know, click the top so you can go to the original post and you'll, you'll see the, uh, the graphics here. I've got a, a few graphics I'm going to post below. So go through, starting in the Gospel of John, with these five questions in mind, and then go through all the other Gospels as well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Here's the five questions. They're all about what did Yeshua say about something. First of all, what did Yeshua say about himself? Second, what did Yeshua say about his father? What did Yeshua say he came to do? Where did Yeshua say he came from? Now, there's not a ton of information on that question, but there is information on that question, and it's important. What did Yeshua say would soon take place? What did he say about himself, his father? What he came to do, where he came from, what will soon take place? It's time to forget everything that your churches and other religious systems have taught you and to start to become a student of the biblical text yourself. You can read this. You can study this. I'll put a study guide below as well so you can learn how to open up the biblical text and understand it, how to develop context. Because if, you don't, if you're not searching for context, you're starting with a pretext. In other words, if you're not looking for what's really going on, that means that you think you already know what's going on and you're starting with that, and that's not good. We've got to approach the text as babies, what does it mean? How do I find out? I have a helpful study guide that's completely neutral, and that'll be below here in a minute too. You know, with everything that's going on right now, it's looking very, very, very possible, perhaps even probable, that we are heading into this period of time right before the return of Messiah, Yeshua and his father, and the whole kingdom, coming to pick a fight with Yahweh and all his followers. You know, 
when this invasion occurs, it says that all of the world's armies will gather together in Megiddo Valley in Israel. I've been there a couple of times, actually. I've actually been to the mound, the old city of Megiddo, which is where we get the term Armageddon. And in this huge valley, which grows predominantly corn and sugar beets and all kinds of things right now, grains, rice, um, that is where it is said that the last battle over humanity will take place. If that's real and it's going to happen, and I think it is because it's, you know, the Christian wants to turn all of this into some metaphor. No, it's real. It's literal. It's going to happen. And so when all of the world's armies gather together there in, in the Megiddo Valley, just a little distance from Jerusalem, why do you think that he is? Because they will literally be in the sky. And Yeshua is literally going to come down and be the king of Israel again. And all the world's armies are going to gather together to go to war against Yeshua. And he will obliterate them. But don't be deceived into thinking this is some alien invasion. If you want to call them aliens, they're not us. What else do you call the heavenly hosts? These people of the kingdom that the text talks about over and over again. When they come, you will be told that this is an alien invasion. And Christians en masse are going to sign up to join the military, to go to fight this, because they've been told that a fake alien invasion is coming and that these aliens are demonic, interdimensional manifestations. And that's nowhere in the biblical text. That's just made up nonsense. That is pure fairy tale. You are being tricked. You are being tricked in advance to see the coming of the Lord and the heavenly hosts as an alien invasion that we need to unite as humanity to destroy. Don't fall for it. The Lord is going to return, and it might not look exactly the way that Christianity has told you. Are you listening? Are you tracking? This is really important. I'm going to sign off now. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you. Please join my mailing list. I don't send emails out very often, probably every three or four months. Um, so if you subscribe and you think it didn't work, you probably probably did. I just don't send very many emails, um, just when it's important. And go back through some of the posts on my Facebook profile. Come and join us over on Telegram, because that's where we get to speak freely. A million people just left Facebook the last month. <laughs> Facebook is going away. Facebook is dying. Come join us on Telegram. Telegram is a bit different, but you'll get used to it. And I get to post things there. I can't on here about a range of topics that are all interconnected with everything that's going on in the world today and the return of Messiah. I love my Lord. I hope I've done justice in lifting him up today before you. And I hope that you are drawn to get to know him better today because of watching this video. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. I've got to lift my phone out of here to switch it off. So have a wonderful day.